Hello, good afternoon. Welcome to Joy Newsroom. We're live on DSTV Channel 4 to 1 and Go TV Channel 1 to 5. We're also live on all our social media platforms at Joy News on TV. Coming up in the next 60 minutes, Parliament's Committee on Mines and Energy directs the Electricity Company of Ghana to immediately publish a load shedding timetable for the ongoing power outages after all key players in the power sector were summoned by the committee to comprehensively address the erratic power situation. That would be customers who will be affected or to be informed ahead of time. So in a nutshell, it's a generation challenge arising from fuel, there's load shedding, there's a generation deficit, and the utilities have to inform customers. Also in this bulletin, former Auditor General Daniel Yaldumelovo has expressed concerns about the misuse of scholarships in Ghana, stating that there is a serious problem within the system if those who are already financially well off are considered needy and therefore become beneficiaries. It disturbs me a lot that people abuse uh, scholarships for gifted but needy students this way. And later in the bulletin, as the recent over 400% increase in passport application fees has sparked widespread public outcry, the flag bearer of the governing NPP, Daniel. Dr. Mohamedou Baumia has acknowledged the legitimate concerns raised by Ghanaians as he says the current application process is burdensome and nurtures corruption. The higher prices for passport now, even with that... I have thought about the higher the cost delays. and delay in the passport application process in the country passport. and intend to implement the my new system car. if elected. And with the new policy ever... Details of these stories and more in the next 60 minutes. My name is Faustina Safo. Thanks for choosing us. We start with Parliament's Committee on Mines and Energy because they have directed the electricity company of Ghana to immediately publish a load shedding timetable for the ongoing power outages. Well, this directive was arrived at after all key players in the value chain in the power sector were summoned by the committee to comprehensively address the erratic power situation currently witnessed across the country. There's more in this report by my colleague Samuel Mbura. The ranking member on Parliament's Mines and Energy Committee, John Jinapur, disclosed after the stakeholder meeting that the underlying factor of the issue is a deficit in power generation, which has persisted since September last year, resulting in low shedding by the ECG. Well, it's obvious that it's a generation challenge. It's been confirmed that there's a deficit, even as at yesterday, they were shedding load. And so clearly, this issue of transformers is neither here nor there. The root cause of the problem, as was confirmed at the meeting, is fuel. And that if they get fuel, this load shedding will be curtailed. And so we've had an engagement with the ministry. They've assured that government is looking for money to procure the fuel. We asked for some definitive dates that was not forthcoming. They just said that they are doing their best. And so the committee has directed that would be customers who will be affected or to be informed ahead of time. So in a nutshell, it's a generation challenge arising from fuel, there's load shedding, there's a generation deficit, and the utilities have to inform customers before their lives are taken out. So That's I, I, all. Is there a definite timeline for them to issue a timetable for Ghanaians? We've told them immediately. Yeah, so but but, but why, why were they keeping this away from us? Is it now that the situation has gone uh, murky or there has always been the situation but they are trying to hide it from us? It's always been the situation, in fact from September. There's always been a generation deficit, and that is confirmed. With a parliamentary committee, you cannot come and dribble anybody. And we put straight, direct questions to them, and they answered in the affirmative. So there's they a deficit. under oath, that's what I'm told. Yeah, if you appear before parliament, you cannot lie. <laughs> if you lie, it's perjury. Is it because you wanted to unravel the truth, that's why you made them to uh, speak on, under oath? Or, I mean, that has always been the standard practice. It depends, it depends, it depends. In fact, uh, the chairman did not even ad administer the whole oath. He just made it clear that they ought to be honest. However, the managing director of the ECG, Dubik Mahama, maintains that 
there is no ongoing load shedding and assures the public that his outfit will continue to make every effort to ensure a consistent power supply. But the assurance is that we are doing our best. The lights are going to stay on. Most of the transformers that we spoke about and the intensification exercises are almost done. So we should just stay positive. There will be a proper statement as to the way forward. Very are you shedding load? We are currently not shedding load. So we are not shedding load. Meanwhile, the Mines and Energy Committee has directed for a timetable to be published to inform the public of the activities. Samuel Athachina chairs Parliament's Mines and Energy Committee. The next for our committee is to monitor what is going on and see that as we've been, it's been resolved that it is not going to be a permanent feature and that the resolution will come as quickly as possible, we, sh we should have it. So that it's not just a meeting, but the reality is with us that we won't have this conversation as to power outages. We don't want this conversation. For the past seven years, we've not had this conversation and we should ensure that it will be something that we won't discuss and that we're enjoying our normalcy. So, Honorable, are we expecting that after this meeting, there should be a timetable from ECG to help Ghanaians plan their lives? Non-negotiable. I think the committee was very strong on the matter that if there are power outages, it could be a problem. But the bigger problem is that those who are enjoying power should know when it will be available. And then they plan their lives around the timetable you furnish them. I think they are not averse to that. It is imperative and they are going to do it. The committee has until Monday to finalize its report and present it to Parliament for further deliberation. Samuel Mbura, Joy News. Well, let's get on the phone now and speak to the Executive Director for the Institute for Energy Security, Nana Mwisi the Seventh. Thank you so much for your time here on Draw Newsroom. We start with the basis. Well, yesterday during the stakeholders meeting between key players in the power sector, the Mines and Energy Committee directed that ECG publish a load shedding timetable. This is long overdue, you would say, isn't it? Good afternoon to you, Faustina, and to your viewers. Yes, uh, we are happy to hear that the Parliamentary Select Committee on Mines and Energy um, is involved in this matter. Mm. In fact, it reflects its role in overseeing and monitoring uh, the energy and mine sector's performance. Um, the new timetable requested by the committee indicate that there is recognized power supply deficit in the energy sector, due to what we have come to know as peanut generation on the back of the and not pay generation capacity. A cop time is long over. Now we are the mind and property have joined in this uh, conversation. Mm. You'd have to position rightly for me because I'm struggling to hear you. But for the first time yesterday, we had the chairman of the Mines and Energy Committee in Parliament, Atachan, admitting, as well as John Dinapo, who is a member of that committee, that indeed it is a generational problem. This is quite shocking, isn't it? Not at all, Fortina. It is not shocking uh, because we in the civil society space uh, knew this uh, quite a long time ago, mm -hmm. more than two months ago, that we are shedding load because we are generating far less than what our big demand is. It may be shocking for um, other people because of the refusal and insisting um, by government and the UPG that there is no load shedding. But we know very well that there is load shedding over the last two months, even today. Uh, the request for a load shedding timetable by the committee uh, indicates that they are advocating for transparency and accountability in managing the power deficit we have. And so it is good. You know, for the, the publicly available timetable will inform consumers about plant power outages, allowing them to fare according to every context. And I, I seem to have lost you there. You'd have to position rightly and then make your point. We've been, if you just join us, we've been discussing the erratic power supply yesterday. Key power players in the power sector, they met and they came to an agreement as to the way forward. Well, we spoke to members of the um, Parliament's Committee on Mines and Energy. 
the chairman, to be precise, at Chechen. We also spoke to um, also the minority in that committee, who is John Jenapo. They all gave varied opinion as to what the issue was. And even yesterday, when we spoke to Dubik Mahama, who is the boss for ECG, he was clear when he said that, indeed, they are not shedding load. But with this directive from Parliament's Mines and Energy Committee that they should indeed release a load shedding timetable, it's key for us. Well, unfortunately, we've lost Nana Amwesi there. We'll pick him up later to get his thoughts about it. Let's do other stories now. The former Auditor General, Daniel Yao Dinuelovo, has expressed concerns about the misuse of scholarships in Ghana, stating that there is a serious problem within the system if those who are already financially well off are considered needy and therefore become beneficiaries. He emphasized the disturbing trend of people abusing scholarships intended for brilliant but economically disadvantaged students in the country and expressed disappointment at the scholarship secretariat's failure to address the ongoing abuse. Speaking on Joe News News file, Dumelovo stated that while perhaps initially the secretariat may not have been aware of these issues, they have now been brought to light, and hence they must act. I thought maybe it never occurred to them that they need to come up with policies or guidelines in order to be objective and ensure that they are serving the public interest instead of uh, other interests. So one would have expected that from 2020 to today, now they will have come out with policies and guidelines so to help people. Anyway, I'm happy to hear that the administration of that scholarship has moved from Gate Fund to the scholarship secretariat. Mm. That by itself is good because that is what the law requires. Right. But if the scholarship secretariat has not been able to do better than Gate Fund, then it is regrettable because I thought that is their preoccupation 24-7. So if all that you do is to administer scholarship, you don't just wake up every day and say, let's give it to Mr. Thor, Mr. Short, Mr. Fat, so, so, and so. No, you must have criteria, and that criteria must uh, be, be published or made known to everybody. Said that, and even, I don't think they can even sit in the comfort of their, or in their, their office and come out with such a policy or a criteria. They need to do a bit of consultation to get uh, different stakeholders' input so that they come out with a policy which will serve the interests of the country. Mm. And to be honest with you, uh, it disturbs me a lot that people abuse uh, scholarships for gifted but needy students this way. But what baffles my mind, honestly to, uh, to, to, to speak, is that the Secretariat allows this to continue. Mm. First, I thought when we did the audit, they, they didn't know. But this has been brought to the fore, and they got to know about it. Mm -hmm. And I remember the gentleman who, uh, Kinsley Abwaji, or so, who was then Dr. Kinsley Abwaji, or those days, he, he was quite new in the office, so I thought maybe uh, he didn't know about it. Well, Deputy Ranking Member on the Education Committee in Parliament, Clementa Park, says there must be a deliberate attempt to favour the less privileged in the award of scholarships. As a society, we ought to make it a priority to provide avenues for the less fortunate to be able to rise, thrive, and contribute, if not for greed, selfishness, cronyism, blatant corruption, and abuse of office and political power. How can anyone justify a situation where the son of a farmer in Fumbisi, who earns less than 500 Ghana cities per annum should be denied a scholarship in favor of a certain minister of state. So regardless of how you cut, spice, and dice it, it is simply wrong. 
Mm. And that is why I've argued that in all of this, we ought to be looking at a legislative framework that should regulate and define and establish who, how scholarships are awarded. And until we do that, and also extricate the scholarship secretariat from the direct control of the executive, from the office of the president, I am sorry to say that this that we are talking about Away from education, the recent over 400% increase in passport application fees has sparked widespread public outcry. The flag bearer of the governing NPP, Dr. Baumia, has acknowledged the legitimate concerns raised by citizens. He indicated that the current application process is burdensome and nurtures corruption. However, Dr. Baumia assured the public that his government is committed to streamlining the process. One major step in this direction is the integration of the Ghana card details with the passport system. This move aims to make the application process more straightforward and minimize human interaction. This more. The higher prices for passport now, even with that, and also the delays of getting passport. And also my dream hope. I have thought about the higher cost and delay in the passport era, application process in the country and intend concept. to implement a new system oh, sure. if elected. And then, Ghana for over 17.6 million, our Ghana card. And yes, sir. Over 17.6. You get to say, Opia or Daimwa or Ghana card. Yeah, but yeah, Ghana card. The current system, nature's corruption, because of human passport contact passport in the application program. process. No, but the but with the new system, no this and will I be eliminated. And I questions, sir. And what passport forms, no? And I may cast, say, all those questions should also be on the Ghana card. And the, all the questions you need, information now you need for a passport, is we also We are going to make it Ghana simple card. by synchronizing data and of your Ghana card new policy with the passport say, system. You do not you have to go through to go another registration processes a again. passport with a passport form if you have a Ghana card. So, over Ghana card, you go to the portal and put in All your you need Ghana to do card is to go ID to the portal number and pay, and your, pay fees. your fee. The passport system. For the passport we just have to extract to your details you. because they Ghana card and produce your data. passport. Omuwa, the biometrics, Omuwa, pictures, Ninina, you don't need to go through another process. To go and apply for a passport when you have a Ghana card. This new system will remove corruption from the system. You just get very simple. Your 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 name, your Ghana card ID, confirm your address, uh, and what whatever who where you should deliver the passport, and then you pay, and then that is it. It will bring you your passport. It's going to be the simplest passport application that we've ever had in the history of Ghana. Well, Dr. Baumia was speaking during a meeting with the Ghana Union of Traders Association. Well, the union is alleging that some powerful persons have succeeded in creating cliques at the ports to deliberately frustrate them in the clearance process and auction their goods at peanuts to their benefits. The association said the practice, if allowed to continue, will gradually collapse local businesses. President of Guta, Dr. Joseph Oping, raised this concern among other challenges confronting the trades industry when the association met the flag bearer of the NPP, Dr. Mahmoud Obamia, on his bold solution for the future stakeholders' engagement. The existing ocean system should be looked at or should be looked into. It's very important that... The rate at which we auction people's goods for lack of ability to clear their goods in time is very pathetic, especially when it is not being sold to uh, the person who actually brought the goods, whether it is being given to him at the same um, duty that is charged him. Normally, it is sold at a pittance, and then it is being done 
by people who have formed a clique. And they are, they are, they are like uh, a highness, sharks, and voters hanging around our goose, waiting for the least opportunity to, to say that the expiry time has come for them to pray upon our capital. This is very frustrating and it kills the spirit of the Ghanaian people. Well, Dr. Baumia, however, assured that the introduction of his flat tax for businesses will curtail the illegalities if he's elected president. Flat rate of tax. A 10 percent, a 10 percent. I am concerned about the current challenges the traders are having in the country, especially duties at the port. It's that simple. So what I will do in my government is to ensure that we introduce a flat rate for all businesses in the country. The new tax system no ever Ghana. The flat there will be a tax amnesty for you to start all over. I will also ensure that the tax system reduces human contact to avoid corruption. It creates room for corruption. And yes, sir. So, said is. Let's head now to the Ashanti region because the former president of the Ghana Football Association says balloting the seventh position for the upcoming MPP primary in the Ajusu constituency is divine. Earlier in his campaign, the former football administrator described himself as the seventh shirted Cristiano Ronaldo fit to replace the deceased MP John Kuma, who he described as Lionel Messi. All nine aspirants for the upcoming election on Saturday were successful at the vetting. Nayal Jima followed the process and filed this report. Nine aspirants filed to contest the new patriotic party's search for a parliamentary candidate for the upcoming by-election at Ejusso. All the candidates, including the four females, excelled in the vetting that was supervised by party officers from the national and regional levels. During the process, some negotiations were held for some candidates to rescind decisions to contest, but little was achieved. NPP's Director of Research and Elections, Evans Numako, explains the process has so far been democratic. Well, for me, I, I would say this democracy at play. We've, we've, we've allowed an open exercise so that nobody will impute an idea of imposition of any candidate on the constituents. Mind you, we are not in normal times. We've lost our dear brother and we should rather undertake an exercise that will be befitting that will appease his soul. Following the balloting, all nine aspirants believe they are on course to winning the election, ascribing meanings to the positions on the ballot paper. Second vice chairman for the Ejusu constituency, Kwabina Bwati, will be first on the ballot paper. If um, the significance of numbers is anything to go by, then it will mean that I've already won the elections because I picked one. And I think that is also quite profound. Um, looking at the work I have done. Dr. Evans Pia, who will show second on the paper, links this to the former MP, John Kuma, who he believes will remain the number one option for the constituency. Number two. Um, I was playing number two uh, to John Apontua, Dr. John Apontua Kuma. And um, today, His Excellency Dr. Mahmoud Baumia was also number two. I think we all know what number two means from the two names that I've mentioned. It's simply a two sure number that signifies that we are going to win this election. Interestingly, Klansman Kakari Mensa links his third position to the performance of former Black Stars striker Asamojan. Who is given to right people as strikers. You know the Asamojan, you know Baby Jet. And you know how he strike hard for Ghana. And um, I'm also, I've also been in football before. And um, I'm very good in scoring. So getting number three now, I know how to do the 
machinations of passing to get the goal. For the presiding member of the Ejusu Municipal Assembly, Helena Mensa, the positioning does little to the advantage of the candidates. And me, I'm okay with the numbers. Every number is a lucky number. So I don't, it's, it's, it's okay. And when you count, you started from the men, one, two, three, four. I'm the first person, a lady, number four. So that one, they can leave the men, the three men, and come to number four and vote for me. The fifth attempt being made by Abuna Pukia Amuabuaite reflected at her fifth position. Another female candidate, Portia Bafo Abronye, steps into the sixth position. Probably the most popular among the candidates, Kwesi Nyantechi thinks picking his favorite seventh position is divine. I had indicated to you all on the day uh, I submitted the form that I was the Cristiano Ronaldo of Ejeso. And God has perfected it by ensuring that I picked number seven. Any football fan anywhere in the world knows that the trademark for Cristiano Ronaldo is number seven. And so the number seven jersey number I took represents my brilliance, eloquence, hard work, and excellence in football uh, as we transfer it to politics. Aaron Prince Bia is claiming to be the one restoring love to the party with the eighth position. Number eight, what it means is love. I just so we've lost the love for the party. So Honorable Aaron is bringing the love for MPP. Those who have departed, they are all coming back because of the love I'm bringing. Mamiya Abwaje, to some supporters, will be easily located as the last candidate on the ballot paper. For joining us, Nanaya Ojima. Let's see in the Ashanti region, the Setra East district, plagued by neglected tropical diseases, is now emerging from the shackle of this burden. In 2023, health officials identified cases including 2,471 of scabies, 22 of lymphatic filariasis, 55 of yao, 5 of leprosy, and 7 deaths among children due to rabies. Well, this finding spurred a proactive response involving case research management, collaboration with stakeholders, and teacher training programs. Well, John Yusuf Mahmoud Mohammed Nuruddin report that these efforts are yielding positive results, restoring and saving lives. In the first of our four series of feature, let's look at the struggles of NTD's patients through uh, patients go through. Meet Daniel Sabatei, a resilient 51-year-old farmer at Edukrom whose fields, once full of promise, now echo with silence. Daniel, who has six children, faced adversity when his supportive wife passed away in 2020. The loss brought numerous challenges, compounded by his current struggle with leprosy. I began to observe unusual changes on my hands shortly after my wife's passing. Concerned about these changes, I sought medical attention, leading to a diagnosis of leprosy. This revelation has left me feeling desperate and increasingly anxious. I am engaged in farming activities, particularly in cocoa, maize, and cassava cultivation. According to Daniel, his sickness has impacted his ability to provide for his children's education, a responsibility he wants managed well. <laughs> Prior to my challenging experience, I dedicated considerable efforts to my work, meticulously weighing my cocoa beans and generating a profit of 4,000 cities. However, it is now disheartening to see that the farm's income is insufficient even to cover the wages of laborers, let alone provide for my own needs and those of my children. The 
metimi anya bi kura ahwe nkwala no his inability to wear a cutlass and work because of his leprosy has significantly disrupted our educational pursuits. As a result, we have had to return to the village to assess him, assuring that he can provide for the family's needs, especially the education of the younger ones. One of the challenges I face on my farm is the uneven distribution of cocoa plants. Leaving certain areas empty, I am seeking assistance to fill those vacant spaces. This improvement is anticipated to boost my overall yield and subsequently increase my income. About a year ago, 41-year-old Yao Job, a resident of Asakori Bomso, was afflicted by leprosy which eventually led to his mysterious death in October 2023. According to his niece, Mami Pokuya, Yao's fingers began to decay and fall off as a result of the disease. Initially, we attributed his condition to a potential curse from a past journey. However, a health professional later diagnosed it as leprosy when it was quite advanced, resulting in the loss of his fingers and toes. He experienced constant anguish, crying bitterly until he eventually passed away. It was heartbreaking to witness the transformation of someone, once energetic and active, who had worked diligently to support his family into someone unable to even hold objects in the final stages of his life. He emitted a strong unpleasant odor and maggots were emerging from his feet. While we shared the same sleeping space, unable to endure the situation any longer, I sought a separate room for him to alleviate the discomfort and provide some relief. My uncle showed great compassion by sharing a room with him. Unfortunately, we soon recognized that my uncle's health was at risk due to this arrangement. Maggots were emerging from his leg, emitting a strong and unpleasant odor even from a distance. At times, he resorted to applying petrol on his leg, leading to the development of gangrene in his toes. Even my mother had to wear a nose mask before delivering food to him. But Daniel and Yao's families are not the only ones who suffered the neglected tropical diseases and TDs. Efia Al Hassan's dreams are shattering by scabies infections, and she has not been able to conduct any successful business for some time now. <laughs> I have been struggling for my well-being for nearly two years without success. This has led to social rejection, making it difficult for me to attend church or visit the town. Even when attempting to go out, I have to wear a sweater to conceal myself. <laughs> Well, the Member of Parliament for Pando has launched an award scheme to celebrate women who have been outstanding in their fields of work. De La Soa said the scheme's Christian Pando Outstanding Women Awards would contribute to empowering women and making them right and fit to take up leadership roles in their community. There's more in this report. Pando Outstanding Women Award, COA, aims to identify women who are working tirelessly in their little corners to enhance the livelihoods of constituents. Women in the fields of politics, health, education, community leadership, agriculture, entertainment, sports development, cultural heritage and artisans would be honored. Member of Parliament for Pandu, Dela Suwa, bettered the idea. So basically, the saying, as the saying goes, a country that doesn't honor its heroes is not worth dying for. And on this month, I decided to honor women in the Pando municipality who have been outstanding in different uh, fears of life. We have women who have been outstanding in the agriculture sector, in the health sector, in the education sector. We have women who have been outstanding in the entertainment sector, in the cultural sector, 
and in uh, many, many sectors. So the decision is to look for those outstanding women and then to honor them. She added that the initiative was also geared towards empowering women. Like I said, if you cannot identify your heroes, nobody will die for the, the, the community. Because, like I said, if you ask anybody now, can you be in charge of this for me? The first thing they'll say is, I don't want insults. So you can see that we are not encouraging, especially women, to take leadership roles in every, the various uh, sectors of life. So this is to encourage women, we we'll do it yearly, to encourage women to take the leadership role in all spheres of life so that um, there'll be examples to other people. So basically this is the concept behind the COA, Pando Outstanding Women Awards. A panel will be constituted to investigate and interview the nominees in the various categories. The winners will be announced on the 8th of May 2024, followed by the main awards ceremony, which will be held on the 12th of May, Mother's Day. Fred Kwame Asari, Joy News, Pando. Well, before we go, let's bring you the story of Monica Abila, a pioneer in forcing Ghana's ride hailing scene, whose journey embodies resilience and determination. Monica was one of the thousands of Ghanaians affected by the banking sector cleanup. After losing her job, she made a bold decision to invest in herself by purchasing a car and venturing into the ride hailing industry. Here's her inspiring story. Before I started driving on boats, I was working in the banking sector. There were some uh, changes in the banking sector which affected my employment. So I lost my job since then. And I, fortunately on my part, I had an investment and I was looking at what business I can venture into. And I decided to uh, buy a car and then go into board business. And so I did that and I bought the car. This is the car I have here. And then after I bought the car, by then I didn't know how to drive and I have to look for a male driver who can take over the car, who knows how to drive. And I did that and then had a, a driver, he drove the car, but the satisfaction I was getting from the driver was not appealing. So I decided to venture into the business myself. So I went into uh, registered driving and then I learned driving within two weeks. I had my documents set and the third week I came to both office and I had uh, registered within the week I was approved, I went through training, and right from there, I started driving boats. Amazing to be a female driver in Ghana here. Um, since I started this job, uh, this business, it has been so much excitement. It makes me explore around and meet new people. And the, when people request me for me to go and pick them up, they are so excited to meet me as a first female driver coming to pick them up for the first time. And apart from being meeting new people, moving around or exploring around, I also make a substantial income for myself, which also which helped me to take care of myself and then take care of my family and other expenses around my life or other things that I want to do in life. So apart from this benefit that I'm getting, I'm also happy to be part of the female drivers in Ghana here among the male drivers. So. Um, that makes me feel um, happy. The call for entrepreneurship to be integrated in Ghana's school curriculum is gaining momentum with a strong push from advocates aiming to instill problem solving skills in school children for the challenges of the 21st century. Well, this initiative was highlighted during a one day business entrepreneurship workshop hosted by Angel Specialist School in Tama. The workshop primary objective is to equip children with the necessary skills to tackle societal problems and nurture entrepreneurial abilities from a young age. The emphasis is on preparing students to become proactive problem solvers even before they complete their formal education. The one-day business workshop, which is the first of its kind, brought together students from grade 7 to 8 of the school. It was under the theme on netting the next global leader 
The workshop is aimed at training the school children to take up key responsibilities and be problem solvers in society. The guest speakers took the students through how to be innovative and problem solvers in the 21st century. I like the fact that they really got the concepts quickly. And again, this speaks to the fact that they are very, very intelligent children and they have very, very good tutors. And so once we know that they have good ideas and we want to hear from them, the next step is to teach them how to pitch their ideas in order to get funding. And um, hopefully we can be a driving force for the next generation. Because I think we need to begin to shape the, the mindset of the next generation because indeed we need business people to you know take up responsibility in this country the students after a short break were made to develop ideas to help solve problems they have identified in the society some of them presented these ideas i came up i came up with course master software which will contain all the textbooks syllabus outline and exercises assignments that students will do on a device so that students wouldn't have to carry heavy bags to school back and forth, which can affect their spinal. Um, my name is Ian Seydou, and I'm developing an app by myself. Um, that is, it's called uh, Workwash, and it's um, it's an app that allows users to uh, pay over the um, and ask or send a message to my company or vans so, so that in the area so that they go there and wash their cars for them. Head of the secondary department of the Angel Specialist School International, Bernard Agbaba, wants entrepreneurship to be included in the curriculum of schools. This program is aimed at giving them a practical awareness, the opportunity to apply themselves, study their society, look at the problems, prefer solutions, and, and make a business out of it. So if there is a, um, a curriculum that would instill set disciplines in them, I, I believe that that would be the right way to go. And that's how we wrap up Joe Newsroom. My name is Faustina Safa. For more news, please log on to myjoeonline.com. Up next is The Law with Samson Ayani. Today, we put the spotlight on legal fees. You should stay tuned in to find out what you need to charge if you're a legal practitioner and also if you're hoping to get any legal you know, um, worker for you coming up. So you should stay tuned in.